But welcome and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I am Eric McPhee, Executive Vice President and Director of Risk Management for Orson New York. I'm pleased to introduce the panelists for today's webinar. I'm joined this afternoon by my colleague, Neil Davidowitz, the President of Orson New York, and Chelsea Shapiro, our Director of Business Strategy and Growth. Chelsea is going to be assisting us this afternoon on this webinar. Our guest panelists include Elizabeth Heck, Chairman, President and CEO of Greater New York Mutual Insurance Company. GNY is a super regional insurance carrier that is the largest rider of habitational real estate in their territory of 17 states. We have expanded our relationship with GNY this year, and Liz has committed to working with us to help strengthen our risk management program. Robert Owens, President of the Owens Group, and Stephen DiMatteo, Executive Vice President and Managing Director of York International Agency. Owens Group and York International are both Orsid partner insurance brokers with regional reach who are known and respected across the New York City condominium and cooperative communities for their habitational real estate experience, among other important and related lines of insurance. <clears throat> Excuse me, just a couple of minutes to introduce uh, topics a little bit. Um, hopefully you all have seen the two prior memos that I circulated on April 18th and May 5th. And obviously if you weren't on the original uh, circulation. You hopefully have received them since then and had an opportunity to sort of review them. Uh, those memos will really serve as a preview and a summary of the issues at hand and the solutions that have been implemented. Uh, so sort of thinking them as a prerequisite in the context for this discussion today. The memo is focused on, among other things, current umbrella market challenges and the timing constraints that we were faced with. Uh, so <clears throat> the purpose of today's webinar is to really provide ORSA clients with a deeper insight into the market conditions impacting the New York City habitational real estate industry specifically and market-wide conditions impacting the broader insurance industry. The topics are gonna to include <clears throat> a brief history of coverages and evolving limits, current market conditions, cat losses, otherwise known as catastrophic losses versus individual losses, risk transfer and impact on labor law, and then sort of a forward looking now what or really what's next in terms of expectations as we move forward. Just before we jump into our topics, we are going to be doing a Q&A session at the end of our presentation. So if you would please direct your questions at any time throughout the presentation to the Q&A section, we will address those once we finish. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, so just to start off, we're just going to give a little brief history of coverages, evolving limits, um, talk about property, ITV, and umbrella limits, uh, which Steve will expand on with respect to umbrella. Uh, ITV was something that we discussed in the memos, uh, and I think Liz will expand a little bit more about why this is important to the carriers. That's a question that we often get. But insurance, insurance to value, which is obviously what ITV stands for really is, it represents the relationship of the value of the insurance uh, limit that's selected versus the actual costs of restoring the damaged property. Um, and so it's important to sort of focus on that. And for those of you who have been with Orsa for a long time, uh, you know, when I began here in 2005, that was something that we focused on uh, very quickly in my tenure because you know, we felt that that was an area that really sort of uh, had room for improvement. Um, and so you'll, you'll hear more about that on this call and it's something that you've likely heard uh, over the years uh, through these insurance renewal um, discussions. Uh, you know, Orsit strategy, you know, in terms of how we deal with insurance renewals, you know, I think, you know, we do things a little bit differently. And for, you know, a period of time, we were sort of going down the old marketing for market sake road. And at some point it started to have really a diminishing return for our client base. And so as things evolved, uh, as insurance tends to do, and we'll talk more about, we decided that really a negotiated relationship was, was the better course of action and really gave our clients sort of the best bang for the bucks. After all, we're not buying widgets, we're buying insurance. And I think it's important to capitalize on the value of the ORSA risk management program. Otherwise, uh, this, the concept of you know, marketing for marketing's sake really creates a very unstable environment uh, year over year because the insurance companies don't have this ability of knowing what their portfolio is going to look like and so on and so forth. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, insurance is always evolving limits, coverages, exposures, 
you know, some examples of some recent evolutions of insurance uh, will include terrorism. Uh, you know, there was a point in time where we didn't have to think about terrorism and insurance. It's now something that we talk about often. Extended replacement cost or ERC, uh, you know, something that is relatively new uh, to the concept of insurance, at least in my tenure with Orsid, to our buildings, uh, cyber liability, social engineering. These are things that we didn't have to think about 10 or 15 years ago that are now sort of central in our focus when we're dealing with these insurance products. Wage and hour defense, you know, these are all the sort of examples of how the insurance industry has evolved to meet emerging uh, trends and exposures and you know, how important it is to sort of stay focused on those emerging trends uh, to make sure that the buildings are covered on a proactive basis, not in hindsight after you've had a loss. Uh, and Steve will talk a little bit more about the evolution of the umbrella programs and limits. But clearly umbrella coverage is evolving and the days of inexpensive umbrellas are really gone. Um, and Steve will get into the structure of how that evolved over time, but I think we've all been sort of in, in a position of believing that umbrella insurance was really quite inexpensive and it was gonna remain that way for some time. And unfortunately, uh, the weight of the labor law claims has just caused an immense collapse in the industry, which you're gonna hear a little bit more about. So uh, with that, I think, you know, Steve, I'll hand it over to you uh, and you can talk about the habitational umbrella. Sure, thanks, Eric. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the umbrella marketplace over the last 10 years to dozen years has evolved from best price in terms with quite a bit of availability to one of, is there even a sustainable market for the claims at any price, given the amount of claims activity? You're going to hear a, a number of recurring themes as we go through this around losses. And there are many different categories of loss. Uh, Liz is going to talk a bit about that. Um, we're going to focus a little bit on labor law. So when we talk about labor law in New York, I think everybody's familiar with it, whether it's uh, 240 or 241, it's the strict liability associated with being a building owner in New York. Um, the number one um, item we have to combat against that is good contractual risk transfer. That's another area the presentation will go into. But important to know that there's been such degraded environment from a claim standpoint. There's been tremendous social inflation in the average amount of labor law claims, the average cost of a claim. So where a dozen years ago, it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it could be retained within your traditional million dollar limit of primary general, general liability coverage. These claims are now well in excess of a million dollars, and there are quite a number of occurrences of it. So the insurers are saying we can't, we cannot attract enough premium to cover the potentiality of these claims. So what's happened is when there, there were five to seven really strong competing for your business risk purchasing groups, now that's gone to a much lower number of carriers and their underwriting requirements are significantly more strict, uh, especially around life, life safety requirements. And just the general availability is, is, is far less available. And if a client wants to build, a building wants to build up to, you know, at, at one point, $200 million was available, you could do it with one or two insurers. Now it's takes 10, 12 insurers, it's almost not, it's, it's not viable. Um, we have the last item on here is we, we will go through some examples of what the industry calls nuclear verdicts that have been driving the cost of insurance and the insurance carriers cost of their reinsurance um, in the, in that environment. So that's, that's sort of how this is one aspect of it, but it's the most disruptive piece of it that a number of our clients have seen. Yeah, and just the only other thing that's left on that slide, if you want to know, there's a little link down there that talks about, um, you know, judicial hell holes. You know, as much as that's a catchy phrase, that's actually a, a website that's sort of dedicated to, you know, focusing on those venues that have really had, you know, these nuclear verdicts and, you know, what we what were being predicted now, as Steve mentioned, these thermonuclear awards. So, um, you know, that's sort of an indication of how the market has transcended. Uh, and can be sort of, you know, explained on a website called Judicial Hell Holes, uh, which New York is included, unfortunately. I think we, I went through most of these items, so we can go to the next slide. 
great. So before I hand this off to Liz, I just wanted to say just sort of a few things, uh, and this will talk more about you know, market conditions, but you know, our strategy on renewal uh, is really to achieve what we consider to be the best result for our clients. And we, and we see ourselves, in, you know, something Neil and I talk about often, as advocates for our clients. You know, price is always a consideration. You know, program stability and sustainability over the long term are really sort of chief among our concerns because at the end of the day, this is not an insignificant expense on the operating budgets. And it's something that we've had a lot of stability in over the course of many years. And we're looking for a return to that circumstances. So we did market, you know, <clears throat> of the 160 buildings that are on the May 1 renewal date, you know, we did send them out to the broader markets. And as Steve sort of mentioned, a very limited appetite, uh, shrinking capacity, and really, you know, very tight underwriting guidelines led to what I would consider to be very few options. So, you know, really, <clears throat> it's sort of important to focus on what was different this year. And, you know, what I'll say is that, you know, as much as we're always cognizant of price, we we're really shopping for capacity because for the most part, up until, you know, this year, we've had capacity. It's, all, it's always been about price. This year, there was really a, a lack of capacity and we needed to overcome that because, you know, first and foremost, at any price, uh, you know, we needed to have coverage <clears throat> first. And so finding that coverage was difficult. Uh, and then again, as we mentioned, the umbrella really is driving the increases on the overall portfolio costs. You know, unfortunately, um, you know, many of the programs, the one that we're in is included in this, but that are dealing with minimum premiums. So that tends to impact on the smaller buildings even more. Um, and so you know, we're cognizant of that. But I think the most important thing uh, about this year was really the collaborative approach and the amount of cooperation that we had between the carrier, the markets, you know, the brokers and Orson really all working together for the benefit of the client, as opposed to everyone holding their, you know, landscape close to their chest. It was really a sort of open discussion to make sure that we got to the right place for the clients. And I think that's something that's important to focus on. So you know, with that, um, Liz, I'll ask you just to kind of get into the market conditions discussion a little bit and um, we'll go from there. Sure. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, so what uh, Steve and Eric did is they gave a very good lead in to the market, focusing on the umbrella market, which obviously was driving a lot of the uh, premium increases this year. But I'm going to take a step back and talk first about the property market, and then I'm going to go back into the liability market, because it's, it's important to understand where insurance companies are at and why. So, you know, the first thing to understand is that there is a fundamental principle in insurance uh, that pricing tends it tends to be cyclical where price pricing goes up and capacity shrinks following a period of pain and so what's been happening in the insurance world is that there has been a significant amount of pain in both property and liability lines of business and also umbrella um, and what has exacerbated that pain is the recent, uh, you know, economic instability and inflation, which has really stressed the market such that it was really at a breaking point. And that's sort of the fallout of what, you know, we started to see this year. So, um, Chelsea, why don't you move to the next slide? So, um, you know, I'm going I'm to mention a couple of things that, you know, are known. So what happened on property? So there are a couple of factors influ influencing what happened on the property side. So the first thing that happened was there were a number of supply chain disruptions that really began during the pandemic when um, we all saw it. We saw it in our everyday, you know, purchases of goods and services. But what we saw on the claim side, the property claim side in the insurance world, is that the cost of labor and building materials went up dramatically. And, um, you know, what happened as the pandemic progressed, this moderated somewhat, just like we saw in our own, you know, purchases of everyday goods, but the costs remained much higher than they were pre-pandemic. So now the second issue uh, impacting property claims is inflation. And so this slide here, uh, you know, on the screen shows something that we already know, you know, it shows the progression of inflation really post financial crisis. So it shows beginning in 2009, when inflation was negative up through uh, 2024, where most economists think, you know, that if inflation, whether it's a hard, soft landing, whatever happens, it's going to end somewhere between two and 3%. Now, um, what, what was happening on the property claim side is when you took the issues that happened 
related to the supply chain. So we already had increases in labor and materials. And then you consider inflation. What we saw is that the, the, um, the cost of claims began to really spike uh, really beginning in 2021 when, it, when inflation spiked up in the first quarter and it, they continue to rise throughout 2022. It's not really a surprise. You know, we saw it in other things that, that impact our lives. But um, as a result of that, what, what insurance companies saw is that the cost of the claims ended up being multiples of what they expected. Now, th that is the reason, you know, Eric mentioned insurance to value. You know, so what 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 is that and how does that impact you? So what what this has caused, you know, because the cost of the claims ended up being multiples of what insurance companies uh, expected them to be there. Um, every company is reestimating the cost of, of what it costs to repair or replace the building that they are insuring to make sure that the values reflect current conditions. This is very important. It's important not just for insurance companies, but also for policyholders, because if as a policyholder, if you are not carrying the right limit, which is something that Eric and Orsid and your brokers have paid a lot of attention to over the years, then it could mean that you could be without enough coverage. So it's something that matters a lot. And, um, it, you know, it's something, again, that you see uh, insurance companies paying a lot of attention to. Now, Chelsea, you can go to the next slide. Okay, now this next slide, it's, it's sort of a busy slide, but it's a very good one because it, it details the third issue impacting property losses. Um, so what this slide shows you is all of the weather events, you know, Eric referred to catastrophe claims, property cat claims or weather events that have a name. And, um, and so what this shows is the cost of weather events by year beginning in 1980. And you can see when you look uh, towards the left hand of the screen, how low you know, those costs were. And then if you look decade by decade, you can see how those costs increased and became a lot more volatile. So if you look at the 80s, the 90s and the 2000s, and then you start to see it um, you know, really beginning in 2017, what those costs have been doing. Now, we all know that there's been a, a big, you know, increase in volatility in weather events. Just, you know, this past week in New York, we suffered you know, a lot of smog from wildfires in Canada. That's the first time I could remember something like that happening. And there's been a lot of uh, things like that, and in, in, in all of it impacts insurance companies. So, just to give you some um, statistics so you understand it, the average cost of weather events was $24 billion for the 41-year the period ended, ending 21. So if you take from 1980 to 2021, the average cost was $24 billion. When you look at the 10-year period ending 21, so going from uh, 2012 to 21, the average cost almost doubled to $44 billion. Then when you look what's happening in the 2020s, the average uh, cost has been $85 billion, so it doubled again. And, and what the insurance companies have seen is, you know, it's a very large number and it, it, it's extreme. And what complicates that is that the weather and the nature of the events are changing. So for example, in New York, Hurricane Ida caused a number of flooding claims, some in buildings that are orchid buildings. And what made this, this flood, this event, different than say Hurricane Sandy, which also impacted a number of buildings, is that the floods were not caused by storm surge, they weren't caused by wind, and they occurred in buildings that aren't even near the water. Um, you know, and, you know, there's a series of reasons why that happened. In part, it has to do with the aging New York City infrastructure. But nevertheless, it is not something uh, that is common for the Northeast, but we all know it's going to rain again. And um, it's the type of thing that makes insurance companies wary because it, you know, because it, it introduces an element of unpredictability in these types of weather events. So um, when you take uh, the supply chain disruptions, you take the, the property uh, cat um, and you take inflation, all of that has impacted the reinsurance market. Now, reinsurance, is um, all, com all insurance companies buy reinsurance and reinsurance is essentially insurance for insurance companies. And without it, no insurance company can operate. It it's, it's essential for us to be able to do business. And because of all of those issues that were um, just impacting the property market in general, and, and the claims costs were higher than anybody anticipated, that has caused 
the reinsurance supply to contract. And, you know, just like, you know, basic economics, when supply goes down, then it's very difficult to meet demands. And, you know, so that's sort of what's happening in the property market. And uh, if, if, with regard to the Orsid buildings, you've been somewhat insulated from that for a number of reasons that, um, you know, that we will go into. But, you know, in general, it, you know, it matters that these, these conditions are happening across the country and really globally because, you know, because of these market dynamics, when, when um, you know, the, the reinsurers pull back capacity, it means the primary companies have to be very careful where they put out limits, what they charge, they wanna make sure that they're uh, collecting a premium that reflects the proper re replacement cost. And that's the type of thing that you, you see. Now, those um, market dynamics are, are very important, but the good news is that in general, the Orsid portfolio has always paid attention to building values. That's the, one of the things that Eric mentioned you know, at the beginning of the talk. So most buildings weren't too far behind inflation, but, and, and because of this and some other factors, what it meant is the property increases in the Orsid portfolio this year were very mild relative to the market. And I think the brokers on this call can confirm that because uh, they're dealing, you know, with, um, you know, with other portfolios, and they can tell you what they see. Now, going back to so that's the property side it explains what's happening on property. General the general liability market and and umbrella, you know, which is essentially casualty business. It's really uh, the same line, you know, the same thing. Those increases uh, in, the, in those uh, lines of business are different than property. And I, Steve did an excellent job explaining it. Eric uh, talked about it. And really uh, what has been influencing those lines, Chelsea, you can turn to the next page, is uh, social inflation. And so social inflation is really uh, a new term. Uh, Chelsea, you want to flip it? Okay, here you go. So what social inflation is, it was a new term that was coined. I think the first time I heard the term was uh, uh, the fourth quarter of 2018. And that, that term really refers to the fact that the cost of these claims, so casualty claims, general liability and, and umbrella are uh, increasing above economic inflation. So, it, you know, social inflation is completely unrelated to economic inflation, which is what we see in the cost of everyday goods. The, the, uh, the, the things that are in, impacting social inflation are the things that are listed on, on this slide. And what they're really leading to is just an increase in, in the number of claims, the frequency, the severity, um, Steve, you know, talked about the, the labor law. There's all sorts of issues uh, regarding social inflation that have impacting the casualty lines of business. Now, the impact of social inflation is seen countrywide, but New York is a particularly challenging jurisdiction for property owners. Steve and Eric both referred to New York's scaffold law, you know, the labor law, labor law 240, 241. Uh, that's one driver of severity, but there are other issues also contributing to the unfriendly landscape. Now, what I will say uh, is that the good news is that there is a way to mitigate. mitigate. Steve mentioned it, Eric mentioned it. Um, uh, so, uh, certain, certain of these exposures, and uh, I'm sorry, Chelsea, go to the next slide. Now, uh, proper risk management isn't going to eliminate the exposures, but um, if, if we spend time working on it, what, what will happen is if it's properly managed, a building becomes much more attractive to, an umbrella, to the umbrella markets, making capacity more available and potentially more affordable. So, uh, you know, to manage the labor law, it's really very important that the buildings have a foolproof way to ensure that, that the risk transfer is proper. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, a building is strictly liable. If, if, a contractor, if you hire a contractor to do local law 11 work and they fall from a height while working on the outside of, uh, of your building, without proper risk transfer, the, 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 the statutory rule will hold the building strictly, um, strictly responsible, even if the building didn't do anything wrong. The building could have done everything right. And, and the way the law works, 
uh, the building is, is, is responsible. So the way to manage that is to have a proper indemnity agreement that holds the building harmless. And, and the contractor signs, you know, uh, Eric, uh, you know, has this down to a science. Uh, he does a, a very good job making sure that all of the property managers are aware of, of what needs to happen. But it's really a, a two-pronged thing where there needs to be a very, very strong uh, indemnity agreement. And we, you know, we've gone over the language to make sure that it's tight. And the contractor insurance, uh, the contractor must have insurance to, to back that up. And the insurance must be um, without exclusions and with an adequate limit. And, um, you know, Eric has some uh, very good rules around, um, you know, what those limits should be. Your brokers help to review, you know, some of those contracts. Everybody participates. And the goal is to make sure that it works because people will fall from buildings and there will be claims. But as long as there is good risk transfer, then the proper party is responsible and it doesn't impact the building's insurance. And what I will say is, it, of late, working on this is much more challenging. I, I, I you know, live in a co-op, uh, you know, we're working on a project. It, it does, it, you know, ensuring that the building is properly protected uh, takes some work and it, it takes a little badgering of some of the contractors, making sure that they, um, that they do it, that they have the right limits. And, but it's worth it because a, an error could uh, cause the building to be faced with a multi-million dollar lawsuit. And, you know, the, the judgments because of social inflation have gotten larger and larger. Once that occurs, it makes umbrella markets wary. Uh, they, they're, they get concerned about putting out limits, um, you know, at the building, because as Steve pointed out, if you can't collect a, enough premium to cover the exposure, then, you know, it scares the markets away. Um, it's also important for shareholders to have sufficient li uh, a sufficient personal liability limit, and Bob is going to explain this in the next section. And you know that that is important because there are a lot of uh, different types of claims that are caused, uh, you know, by um, a unit owner, a shareholder, and so when that when there is a, a proper protection there, then that also helps to uh, protect the building's um, excess limits. Um, the, there is another driver of severity. So the thing that the umbrella markets care about is severity, because um, if you think about those limits, that's really, you know, they're putting out a large limit and the goal is to have it be at an affordable premium. And, and so the only way that works is to, to somehow mitigate against that potential severity. So when you're talking about labor law, having a good indemnification, that works. When you talk about life safety, there are also things that can be done. Now, there are some things in buildings that umbrella markets uh, care about that, that you can't do anything about. So for example, a lot of umbrella markets are concerned, uh, by the way, when we talk about life safety, what we talk about is protecting the residents. So when there is a tragedy, you know, a fire or some other tragedy in the building, you know, how do you be best protect the residents, which is obviously a goal of everybody, everybody on this call, or said brokers, you know, everybody wants to make sure every shareholder is safe. Um, so there are some umbrella markets that get concerned when a building is too tall, uh, you know, because it will take longer for somebody to evacuate from the building if you have a building that's too many stories. Another concern of some umbrella markets is, or all umbrella markets, is one means of egress. If, if you don't have a second way to get out of the building, it causes con concern because what happens when you have a tragic event? Obviously, uh, that is not, a, you know, neither one of those two things are an easy thing to fix. But there are other things that can be put in place that help really tighten the safety that would then make an umbrella uh, market more interested in, in uh, working with that building. So um, uh, what I will say is that ORCID is very cognizant of the triggers that, um, that uh you know, concern insurance companies. And what we will be doing together with ORCID and your brokers is to identify areas that will help best protect uh, the ORCID portfolio. So with that, I think um, we're gonna turn it over to Bob and you're gonna tell us about um, personal insurance. Well, thank you, Liz. And Bob, before we get started, I just wanted to say just a couple of things. Um, you know, we talked about you know, liability limits, and it's certainly a topic of discussion this year on the renewals, seeing the limits decline in many cases from 125 million, you know, down to, uh, to in some cases, 20 million or 30 million uh, and, and a few, in a few limited cases. So the question often comes up is, you know, how much is enough, right? You know, how much do we really need 
uh, is 125 million the right number? Is 300 million the right number, or is five million the right number? And you know, different boards, you know, really have different opinions about what they think the exposure is. So, you know, it's, we feel it's our job to try and educate folks about how much the limits really matter. <clears throat> what are the scenarios that could, you know, result in a in a you know claim, you know, breaching the umbrella limits and so on and so forth. And so, uh, we just wanted to give folks some examples. Of some of the um, some of the you know claims, uh, the first couple of slides here really represent G and Y's uh, you know sort of vast experience in this area, and, uh, and you can see that the slide goes back to two thousand and five. Uh, yeah. By the way, Eric, I want to just say something uh, just about G and Y. We've been um, uh, writing habitational residential uh, real estate in New York City for over a hundred years, so we really do have a long history of doing it. And um, so uh, this, I think we went back, right, we went back to 2005 to identify claims. One thing I will say, and, you know, Eric is going to go through uh, the claim scenarios to talk about, you know, the, you know, the difference of what's probable and what's possible. What I will tell you is that even in our portfolio, we've seen a very big uptick. So there are more claims, the demands are higher, so there's much more exposure to the building. Sorry, Eric, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, of course. And that's all really important because you know part of what this what these slides are going to reflect is you know G and Y's experience. But I have to say, you know, I've been I've been I've been in the insurance business for a very long time, even before I joined Orsid to, to design their build their risk management program. And, and I will tell you that you know G and Y, unlike many companies, will defend these claims to the hilt, um, you know, more so than many companies, and is willing to go to the mat and go to trial if need be, or at least feign. <laughs> the possibility of going to trial, uh, you know, they're not afraid to go to trial, which, you know, sort of puts the plaintiffs on the defense. Uh, whereas if they just believe that they're always going to be able to settle a case for some ridiculous amount of money after they had a, you know, an ask that, you know, well exceeds your primary limits, I think it sort of changes, you know, the outlook of the claim. And so as much as there's some pretty big claim numbers on here, you'll see in a couple of slides, there are much bigger exposures out there. Um, they're just not reflected in the GNY portfolio, which is, is in part due to how they treat these claims and how they defend them so vigorously. So, you know, and, and, the thing and Eric, want... there's one other thing. It's also the reason we're willing and 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 want to stay in, you know, uh, handling uh, New York City properties because we believe there's a way past it. But again, they've been ticking up and it's been tougher and tougher. So go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, of course. And so one of the things we sort of, you know, in terms of what's the right limit. You know, just like on the property limit, you know, people say, you know, well, what if the building were destroyed? How much, would, how much insurance would we be able to, you know, settle for? And so that's a tricky question. And it's, and it's sort of just as tricky on the, on the liability or the casualty side, in the sense that we're not always insuring for the maximum possible loss. The same, we're not insuring for the maximum possible loss for the building to be destroyed because the odds of that happening are really quite low. Um, so what we're really insuring for in many cases is the maximum probable loss. Uh, which is sort of what you know this year reflects, I would say, in terms of the limits. Uh, it was nice to have 125 million or 200 million dollars in limits, but you know that sort of represents you know a sort of very high and unattainable uh, you know reach for the claims experience that we're that we're familiar with. Uh, so I'll, I'll just say that, and and I'll also say that you know really single injury claims, in my view, and I think Liz would probably agree with this, are really the greatest exposure with labor law, right? And so with all these uh, claim examples that you see on this slide, and Chelsea, you can go through another, go to the next slide. Uh, you can sort of see, you know, as, as time evolves, you know, so do some of the uh, amounts. Um, but really, you know, these, these, are, these represent single injury claims, which is a single person injured, uh, and in this case, you know, mostly by labor law claims, not all labor law claims, but most of them are. And so, you know, what these umbrella limits don't necessarily represent are, you know, catastrophic losses, you know, building, you know, collapsing like what we saw down in Florida, uh, or you know, a large explosion, or something along those lines, where you have mm -hmm. multiple fatalities. So the umbrella limits that we're carrying really don't contemplate uh, that sort of a claim scenario. Even at 125 or 200 million, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that they really contemplate that sort of a catastrophic claim scenario. So it's important to have that focus when you're thinking about this. Uh, I will tell you that although it remains unsettled. The building that collapsed down in Florida, uh, from what I understand, is approaching you know a global settlement that's you know now I think close to a billion dollars. And so, you know, what building is going to even be able to obtain a billion dollar umbrella or anything close to that? Really, nobody, uh, no one would even put out that limit. So, 
uh, is sort of comes back to the risk management strategies and the things that we do to try and keep the building safe and not needing that level of insurance. Um, clearly, whatever that you know effort was failed in Florida. So these are some other examples. Uh, as you may or may not know, the umbrella policy also covers your DNO <clears throat> um, claims. And so um, I suspect that most of the folks who are on this call are also on the board of one of our buildings. And so I imagine this is very important to each of you individually. Um, so it's important to understand that the umbrella limits also are in, in excess of the DNO primary limits, which this year you'll see in most cases, unless a building had a claims history that wasn't favorable, was increased to $2 million on the primary limit. And then you had the umbrella limit over and above that at either 20 or $30 million in most cases. So this kind of just gives you some examples of some non, um, you know, per bodily injury labor law claims, um, you know, dealing with, as you can see some here, uh, breach of fiduciary duty, breach of contract, uh, hostile work environments, you know, some other examples here. Um, sort of a different claim scenario in terms of value, but never, nevertheless, you know, substantial. Okay, Chelsea, the next slide. Okay, so now, you know, I did sort of my own research and, you know, my, my, my experience is before Orsted involved dealing with, you know, sort of construction related claims in some levels. Um, and so I can tell you, you know, of, of some of the firms that really specialize in construction related in incidents and, you know, litigation, you know, Saxon Sachs is one of them, Gary Garconison is another one. There's, you know, hundreds of others uh, who are focused on this um, because of how lucrative it is in New York City in particular. But you can see that, you know, beyond the experience of GNY, there are certainly verdicts that go beyond, you know, some of the levels that we've talked about as being our historic experience. Uh, and, you know, obviously this $85 million is an outlier, but it's nevertheless <laughs> a published case. Um, and then you can see below that, we have some that are, you know, closer to the limits that we're talking about. You know, these would be along the lines of these, you know, thermonuclear verdicts that we were just referencing earlier in the slideshow. Uh, next slide. Just giving you some more examples. Uh, you know, most of the, almost always, all, all these are construction related claims. Next slide. Okay. <clears throat> so obviously, you know, risk transfer is something that we're all very focused on. Um, and so as Liz, suggested, and I know it's been frustrating for some of the board members who are probably even on this call, you know, you think you have a contractor in place and then he sends over the insurance policy and lo and behold, he has an exclusion for the exact work that you're trying to contract him to do, which, you know, is very frustrating both for us and for you. Um, but, you know, these are the sorts of things that we're focused on. But, you know, risk transfer goes beyond just dealing with the contractors. You know, there's, we're not, the building is not the only venue by which we hire contractors. Uh, you know, shareholders hire contractors all the time, and the risk transfer is really just as important for them because, you know, even though they're not working on the exterior of the building, you know, they are working in the protected trades. Uh, you know, really the labor law protects all elements of construction trades um, and mostly repair trades as well. So even if someone's called in someone for a repair, automatic light just went out. I love that when I sit in my chair for too long and the lights go out and I can't get them back on. So let me just bear with me for a second. Thank you. <laughs> Robbie to the rescue. Thank you, Robbie. In any event, um, so it's important that we not only focus on, you know, the contractors that are hired by the building, but any contractor who really works in the building is protected under the labor law section. So um, there's very, really very few exceptions. And unfortunately, the legal landscape is such that the, uh, the cases are expanding to include more and more activities uh, under the labor law. So, you know, Bob, maybe you can just sort of take us through a little bit on, you know, the importance of risk transfer and how it relates to the personal lines. Well, thanks, Eric, and hi, everybody. I think that's a great uh, lead in to the fact that over the recent uh, past, many New York City co-ops and condos have adopted house rules that mandate insurance coverage for all owners. And the reason that this trend has come into play is that more boards are realizing you have the labor law claims and that also on non-labor law claims, if unit owners have insurance in the event of a covered claim, the insurers for the affected owners and the building itself work together to resolve the claim. And you don't, you as board members don't have to hear about it in the elevator going down. Uh, these uh, circumstances are controlled by you know, responsibility for repair and replacement of the property. 
The carriers also use their expertise to defend and settle liability claims for bodily injury and property damage. The most common claims uh, among buildings in New York are often, that also affect uh, multiple apartments, are from water damage. And the typical examples are overflowing sinks, toilets, or tubs. But another frequent claim source is broken hoses attached to washers or dishwashers. And putting in metal ones instead of plastic ones uh, should also be maybe a house rule because we see a lot of these claims. The one size fits all part of this process is actually the insurance mandate itself um, because there are significant variations in the coverages required for each building that's based on the building's own demographics, its construction, and other unique factors. Another reason for variation in coverage being mandated is that personal insurance uh, carriers in New York City, unfortunately, have their own unique filings that make the process a little bit more difficult for ORCID and the boards in deciding how to do this. Two examples of that disconnect among carriers is that buildings that mandate a million dollars or more in liability coverage, which is probably the minimum that people should have, in that case, most of the carriers would require you not only to have a homeowner's policy, but also an umbrella liability policy. And then to complicate matters further, some of the carriers that write in New York uh, will not write the umbrella for shareholders who don't own a car. And I'm sure there are plenty of people on this call who may, you know, who live in these buildings uh, and, and don't have cars because many New Yorkers don't. So, uh, overall, Owens Group has been, you know, our personal insurance division has assisted ORSID and many of its boards over the years in adopting an insurance mandate. Uh, to do this, to help out, we provide current market and policy information to all shareholders as to how you can meet the new requirements. And we also participate in shareholder meetings alongside representatives from other carriers including direct writing companies such as uh, Allstate. So please be in touch with Eric and his team at Orsid if Owens can be of any assistance to you in this area and we'll be happy to, uh, to meet with you and help out. Great, Bob, thank you. Um, so again, the other sort of tie into this too really has to do with the apartment alterations and you know, as I'm sure all of you are aware, when someone signs an alteration agreement, they're also assuming responsibility for claims that arise out of those uh, alterations, you know, operations. And so, as I said before, the labor law piece is important because if someone is injured while they're on a ladder or otherwise struck by a falling object while they're working on that construction project, it's really important to make sure that you know, just like the contractors have insurance to back up their obligations, you want the shareholders to be sure that they have insurance to back up the obligations they've undertaken in the alteration agreement. So uh, one, one particular focus uh, for many buildings has become really around the alterations process and making sure uh, that shareholders are appropriately insured. Um, okay, so really that sort of brings us to sort of the last uh, thing that we're gonna sort of focus on today, which is really what's next and, you know, where do we go from here? And, you know, what I can say about all of that is, you know, none of us has a crystal ball. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> but I think, you know, of all the things that we've talked about, it's really important for us to control those factors that we can influence, you know, like loss control. You know, we can't control inflation or legislation, um, but we can certainly provide additional training on risk transfer and loss control to those folks that are tasked with managing the building. Uh, to resident managers, even to board members um, who are promulgating many of the rules for the buildings. So uh, our focus is really on stability, affordability, and suitability of the products that we're providing uh, to all of our clients. And, you know, this year, uh, more than any other year in my tenure here, which is now 18 years, <clears throat> uh, it's been a very difficult year because of the umbrella and the lack of capacity. Uh, but we are nevertheless committed to working with our partners and really forming new relationships along the lines of what we did this year. We essentially worked very carefully with Greater New York Mutual, our broker partners, to create an umbrella market that really doesn't exist in the industry today. Uh, and so we're very cognizant of the fact that the pricing was not where we would like it to have been. Uh, but you know, we're thinking of this as sort of a you know, stepping stone onto bigger and better things for the next renewal cycle. 
uh, and hopefully something that's going to be priced more competitively uh, and a little more palatable to the smaller buildings. Uh, and our goal is always to create relationships that benefit our clientele and to strengthen our program uh, and the markets uh, as they evolve. So I think with that, uh, we can kind of get into the uh, Q&A period. I think we're at that time. Okay, we will start from most recent and work our way back just for organization of our thoughts here. Um, okay, our first question is with 7 1 reinsurance renewals fin nearly finished, does GNY foresee a leveling off in premiums and greater excess capacity coming back into the market? Eric, I assume that one's for me. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I think so. Respond. The one yeah. thing that I'll say before you respond, though, is that I am pleased to announce, and I think I discussed this briefly in one of the memos uh, that, that we had published. You know, we talked about a rate lock agreement, and I'm pleased to say that Liz and I have agreed on a rate lock agreement, and we will be sending out some information about that very shortly. But I think it sort of goes to this question because it is going to offer more stability in the certainly in the package premium for the next cycle. Yeah, and if you're talking in general about capacity in the umbrella space, that that you know, there's a, a couple of things. Seven one is a time when um, the property market, you know, that's a big uh, renewal period for property cat, and uh, from what I understand. It's, you know, it's, it's been another difficult uh, renewal season. I think not quite as tight as 1-1, one, one, um, but uh, rates are up. I think, uh, you know, there's a little bit more capacity in the property market, but not much. So not much has moved, you know, um, because of that. In the umbrella space, again, we're dealing with something that's a little bit different. It's, uh, you know, there are some issues that are really uh, uh, they're countrywide, but also unique to New York. At some po point, there may be some more capacity, but I don't see anything, you know, in the next, you know, couple of months just because of the 7 1 renewals. Thank you, Liz. Our next question Are there insurance discounts for water leak detection solutions with central monitoring to clarify discounts to the building policy or individual shareholder policies? Yeah, I can answer that. I mean, what, what I will say is there's commercial lines doesn't really work in the same manner as like personal lines. If you put an alarm system in your house, you get a discount. If you have multi-line policies, you get a discount. You know, if you have anti-lock brakes on your car, you get a discount. You know, in the commercial lines, it works a little bit different. And if a building is at the point where they've had to install, you know, pressure monitors and water uh, mitigation devices, that probably means that you've had some losses already. Uh, and that you're in a position of needing to mitigate against future losses in order to make yourself, you know, sort of more attractive to the to the current marketplace. Uh, and I can tell you, we've had a good deal of experience with that in some of those products. Uh, and, you know, we've been able to you know, rehabilitate, so to speak, some buildings that were otherwise really sort of on the brink of, you know, being in a very difficult insurance situation. So no discounts per se, but for buildings that have had losses, um, I would say, you know, it's certainly a good idea to consider this. And these are among the things that we're going to be considering as we're expanding our relationship with Greater New York Mutual on the loss control side. And I will say that if you are a building that really doesn't have a history of water damage losses and you're doing this proactively, uh, it's something you should certainly bring to my attention and <clears throat> to the attention of the account executive so that we can bring it to the attention of the brokers and the carriers as part of the renewal process. And uh, it's, a, it's an excellent thing to do, and I can't say I have many buildings that have been proactive on that kind of thing um, <clears throat> without having experienced the losses first, but it's certainly not a bad idea, particularly for pre-war buildings. And Eric, since uh, the gentleman asked about uh, personal insurance too, there are discounts for this that vary between companies, so it's definitely worth doing because as I mentioned in my part of the talk, if this is the biggest um, driver of claims, the, the biggest frequency is water damage for personal insurance carriers. So they're happy to have you put, you know, the little monitors in front of sinks, toilets, uh, you know, dishwashers and so on, and you'll get a discount for that. Thank you all. 
In the past, some contractors for very large jobs created LLCs for individual jobs to insulate themselves from loss or litigation. Is that still an issue? You know, it, it potentially is an issue, but it's something that we're sort of cognizant of on the managing agent side of things in the sense that, you know, we always want to try to expand the bid list, but at the same time, we want to deal with folks that are sort of tried and true and who we know and we have relationships with that are reliable and they're not, you know, sort of playing these shell games. And so I think, you know, that really comes down to the stability of our relationships with a you know, large group of contractors. You know, Neil and I have this discussion all the time about how, you know, these increasing uh, insurance requirements are really sort of putting a strain on some of the smaller contractors who really do good work. Uh, it's, you know, it's unfortunate the fact that it's sort of eliminating the, the possibility of even using those folks because they can't afford to buy the insurance. And so it's creating some consolidation, but you know, we're, we're pretty cognizant of, of using, of not using contractors who we're not familiar with and who we don't trust. And also, if we have the insurance policy, in most cases, if it's a building, you know, it's a building that's hiring these contractors, you know, we're very careful to make sure that the insurance is on point. So even if the contractor goes bust, as long as we have his insurance on the line, you know, we should be okay. Thank you, Eric. All right. Regarding individual shareholder renovations, the question is, should we assume that risk transfer should also occur between co-op corporations and individual shareholders? I mean, that is the intent of the alteration agreement is to have shareholders be responsible, but ultimately, you know, we, we would also like to, to insulate the shareholders from liability as well, which is, you know, another, you know, sort of step in the process. And, this, and we haven't really implemented this because we, you know, the pushback has been pretty significant and people who are, you know, trying to commence an alteration are already frustrated because, you know, it's a, it's a frustrating process just by nature. And to be told that you now have to get the insurance uh, policies for each of your contractors, you know, after you've signed the contractors, you know, it just makes the whole thing difficult. But uh, what we've tried to do is educate folks about the importance of getting good qualified contractors who have appropriate insurance. And this way, the shareholder is also insulated. You know, the tender can go straight to the contractor who was indeed responsible, likely for the loss. Uh, but for those contractors who are hired by shareholders that don't have good insurance and the shareholders say, well, you know, it's my risk, you know, let's leave us alone. We just want to renovate our apartment. There's not a lot we can do about that. Um, and if, you know, if they want to take on the risk, that's something that they can do unless the board takes a position that's contrary to them. Thank you. We have labor law claims, extreme weather events, and also just more water leaks from aging infrastructure. Which of these or some other factor entirely is the biggest driver of insurance cost increases and lack of availability? It's a long question. Yeah, so I think just to repeat, it sounds like <clears throat> between property and casualty insurance, you know, which are the things that are driving the insurance costs the most? I think Liz, you're probably in a good position to answer that. I would say that based on the renewals that we saw this year, clearly the proposals uh, indicate that the vast majority of the additional premium that was incurred this year related to the umbrella costs. Um, that's not to say that that, ha and that that hasn't been, you know, the property in prior years, but certainly this year it's being driven by the umbrella. I, so what I will say is across the market, it's every one of those things, you know, every one of those things really drives up the cost. Um, I think what you saw in the Orsett portfolio, again, is the issue with um, a lack of capacity in the umbrella market in New York, which is really driven by severity, which, you know, labor law is one of the big exposures. But it, that, it, that isn't it. It's, you know, it's, it's a number of things. So I, 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 if I had to categorize them, I would say in the Orsett portfolio this year, it's the severity. Water damage um, does impact liability coverage. What happens is if there is a propensity for water damage claims um, and, and they're paid, uh, you know, often, then, uh, you know, you could end up with the same issue. But, but it, as a marketplace challenge, I think it's, it's uh, you know, it's the severity that's driving the excess market. Thank you, Liz. We only have a couple minutes left, so we're going to get to as 
many questions as we can. We won't be able to get to all of them. So thank you for submitting them. We'll try to get to you afterwards. Uh, does the panel have a recommendation for the amount and types of insurance that individual co-op shareholders should be mandated to carry on their apartments? You know, I think Bob, I'll let you take this one. I'll just say as a preliminary matter, I've had this conversation with many boards and you know, it really depends on the composition of the building, sort of the value of the apartments, the contents that are inside those apartments. Um, even the height of the building could, could be, you know, could impact on those things that have a large you know, a tall building that has a cascading water damage claims through many large apartments, obviously, you're going to have a much larger exposure uh, than if you had smaller apartments. But, you know, it's a difficult question, um, because it really depends on, as I said, the, you know, the composition of the building. But I think Bob mentioned earlier that a million dollars is, is sort of the, you know, place where most buildings seem to be settling. There's been a few that have settled a little less than that, and a few that have settled a little more than that. Right, and we had discussed in our rehearsing for this that any coverage is really better from the building's point of view than no coverage. And you're doing your neighbors and fellow shareholders or unit owners a favor by having some coverage in place. But it is it is very much bespoke because you know it's easier. I'm talking now as an insurance salesperson. If most of the apartments in a building sell for three million dollars. It's easier to talk about getting a five million dollar umbrella just because you want to protect your the value of your apartment uh, if you got sued because let's say you created a fire and somebody died upstairs. So th this is real stuff for really bad uh, situations. But I think the boards run into the problem of what does it cost, what's available, and so on. And that's where I, I think ultimately. The mandate should be for something that most of your fellow uh, shareholders or unit owners can afford and is more than they have now. There, there are just too many people who look at the, uh, you know, the budget of the building. I've had, you, we've been doing this for a long time. People think that because there's an insurance line item in the budget that they're insured. And they are for part of their apartment, but not for their own liability and, and so on. So um, that, that's one of the reasons we've all spent a lot of time, you know, meeting with individual boards and fine tuning it to the building's uh, demographics, really. Thank you, Bob. Um, okay, Chelsea, I, I think we have a couple of um, questions here from the same board members. So I think we should try and get to a couple of those. Uh, yes, at least. I was going to. Okay. Um, when did Orson receive notice of renewal of the contracts for the current period? It seemed that it was late to some clients. Sure. I'm, I'm glad you actually brought that up. And that was something that we sort of discussed in the memos if you had an opportunity to review them. But you know, the timing this year was among, I would say, our greatest challenge challenges. Um, you know, because of the efforts to get as many markets involved as we could. Um, you know, and getting those markets to respond, you know, it, it really created a timing challenge. And, you know, the carriers are sort of overwhelmed right now as well, because there are, as I mentioned earlier, very few good options. And so those, those good option carriers are receiving, you know, tons and tons of applications. So I know I will tell you that, you know, part of the reason why we addressed it in the memos is because it was relevant this year and certainly contrary to how we've handled it in the past, whereas, you know, we used to get the proposals out 30 days in advance or as close to that as we possibly could give the boards an opportunity to make some decisions if there were decisions to be made and then, you know, get back and find, find the coverage. I will tell you that this year, um, it goes to light again. <laughs> I apologize, I'm in the dark. I was, this year, I will tell you, it was vastly different because we had such a difficult time, you know, getting the information back from, from the insurance carriers. And frankly, the umbrella market that we created, as I said, didn't exist. And, you know, getting them to, you know, really massaging that to the point where it was something that we could actually uh, you know, provide to our clients took a tremendous amount of time and they were very slow to get quotes out. So I will tell you that, you know, not, not as a pity point, but <laughs> for the policies that, re that, that renewed on May 1st, uh, I was sitting in my home office on Sunday afternoon of April 30th at four o'clock in the afternoon with many of the folks on this call binding coverage for every single building because up until that moment, we didn't have, you know, all of the necessary you know, pieces that we needed to do that. And so that's really 
when I say it came down to the wire, that's really how close it came. Um, and so, you know, given the choice of, you know, giving clients the opportunity to see this and then binding coverage or binding coverage to maintain continuity of coverage, you know, obviously the choice is easy there. We're not going to allow the buildings not to be insured properly. Thanks, Eric. Okay. What are the specific actions building can take to mitigate hardening of the market? You know, I guess I'll, I'll start that off and then, you know, maybe we can, we can have more of a collaborative response to that. I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, and knowing from which building this question comes, you know, it, it's difficult to say with any level of degree of specificity, you know, what things could be done to impact this. And I think really, you know, sort of maintaining, you know, a good risk transfer uh, program will be helpful because we certainly don't need any need the merits, you know, on top of some of the other challenges that are being faced by some of the very large buildings. Um, you know, some of the buildings have started to already consider, you know, central fire alarm systems and things like that, that, um, you know, would help to present sort of a better risk profile to more markets. So, and these are things that, you know, I think we're going to be talking more about with those clients who are interested in, in changing the profile of their building. Um, but, you know, certainly, you know, deductible structures are things that we can look at. Although lately, you know, the deductibles have already been, you know, sort of skyrocketing. And so there's been sort of a little benefit to taking on higher deductibles. And so that's something that's a strategy that we haven't really implemented, but it's one that in the past has worked. Um, so, you know, Liz, you could probably expand on that a little bit in terms of what other things buildings might do to try and you know, improve their position in this hardening market. I, you know, I think the bottom line is everything that you said, Eric, is it's when um, the building makes an effort to, to mitigate the risk exposures, it makes the building more attractive. So, um, and, and so it's really having tight, you know, risk management uh, program. Uh, it's trying to address, you know, the, the concerns of some of the excess markets, you know, some of these life safety concerns. Um, it's, it's paying attention to, um, uh, replacement cost and things like that. So it's it's really making an effort. You know, it's that that's really the best, that's the best thing because um, you know, so the goal is to be able to put together a program where um, markets, you know, will be attracted to it. So it, it's really trying to show that uh, there, you know, that there's a process in place and that it works. Thank you. You know, I see, I see that we're over time here and we extended it a few minutes to try and get to as many questions as we can, uh, but there is quite a number of questions yet to be answered. And so I think, uh, Chelsea, this chat is going to be saved, obviously, right? So uh, any questions that we don't get to during the course of this webinar, we will respond to in writing and publish for everyone to see, because if anyone has one question, it's likely others have the same question. So we'll be happy to put that information out there. Uh, let's take a couple of more while we're here. All right. Since shareholders have no incentive to transfer risk onto themselves from the shared responsibility of the building, how do you deal with shareholder dissatisfaction with these risk transfer strategies? You know, it, it's difficult because sometimes we don't always have the support of the board um, on these things. So I, I would imagine that shareholders should have every incentive on the risk transfer stuff to protect themselves. But, you know, many times that's not always the case and they just are more focused on the timing of their project than the risk transfer. And, you know, I've heard many times shareholders say, well, I have insurance for that. So, you know, it's, it's hard to battle against that. You know, we're the managing agent. We're not necessarily trying to be the police, although we find ourselves in an enforcement role often. So, you know, we try to you know, deal with things within reason as much as we can. But it's not to say that you know, we don't always achieve the goal. Uh, in some cases, you know, the, 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 it's really up to the client to say, you know, just let it be, we'll get the next one kind of thing. But, you know, it's up to us to really educate the shareholders, educate the boards on what we feel are the better practices, and then let them make the decisions. Um, but, you know, we're certainly not in a position to force it. I, I, you know, Eric, just to add one thing, the alteration process that Orsid um, sticks to is a good one because the alteration agreement itself really transfers the risk when there is a project that's ongoing uh, to the shareholder. So, and, and ORSA does a very good job asking for um, in, insurance at that point in time. The, the, the time that it becomes a little more difficult is when it, it's not part of a major alteration where there's an alteration agreement. Would you agree with that? 
Eric? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've had folks, you know, that want to bring in painters because they want to quickly get their apartment on the market and, and you know, and not lose the, you know, the timing of the market or, you know, for whatever reason, they're motivated to sell. And, you know, it's painting is among the things that are protected under the labor law. And all you need is one guy to fall off the ladder and you've got a labor law claim. And, you know, the shareholder is going to be impacted, but the co-op even more so because, you know, essentially that's the deep pockets in most cases. And so, uh, you know, those are the difficult things where you have people saying, I just want to paint my apartment. What's the big deal? In fact, it is, it can be a big deal. What about Eric simply asking the handyman to change a light bulb in your apartment and you give him the ladder? Well, if it's a building's handyman, I guess, and it's the building's ladder, that's one thing. But, you know, no, I'm saying if it's your ladder in your apartment, you happen to have a ladder. He yeah. came up, he didn't know he was going to replace the light bulb. You give him your ladder. Yeah, I mean that. Listen, anytime you give out a ladder, you're always assuming the liability for the condition of that ladder. And frankly, you know, there's plenty of perfectly good ladders that people fall off of. But of course, no one's going to say that there wasn't anything wrong with the ladder. The allegation is going to be the ladder was defective. Never mind the fact that you know the guy was not you know behaving or not operating in a safe way. You know, we have seen in particular. You know, where superintendents or resident managers have tried to be helpful and, you know, the contractor shows up there to, you know, do something at the plumber, you know, in a space and, oh, I don't have a ladder with me. You know, so what does he do? He runs down and gets a ladder from the basement and brings it up. And sure enough, you know, 20 minutes later, the plumber's laying on his back and we have a legal letter, you know, a week later. So I think it's, you know, these are the sorts of things that we've tried to educate people about that, you know, seems like everyday routine stuff, but really, you know, is can be risky. Uh, I think we're starting to lose some folks now. It seems like a lot of people are dropping off. So I think we'll do one more question, and I think we will um, uh, we will end end it at that. Uh, I think, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Chelsea. Sounds good. Uh, I'm worried about being underinsured. If claim costs have increased due to market conditions, and my premiums in my renewal have skyrocketed, but my coverage limits have stayed the same or gone down, does that mean I'm likely underinsured? You know, it, it really sort of depends, I think, on, you know, what the exposures are, right? I think, you know, on a, um, on a personal lines, you know, if you're talking about personal lines or commercial lines, but, you know, on, a pro on the property side of things, I think, you know, we'll, we feel that we are adequately insured. I think, you know, on the casualty side of things, we also feel that we're adequately insured, but we're simply bringing to everyone's attention the fact that, you know, the market is evolving and, you know, what we have experienced in the past is not what we're experiencing today and it's not what we expect to experience going forward and so we're making adjustments um you know to deal with those uh, changes and the evolution of these sort of insurance coverages but you know i don't feel as i sit here that any of our buildings are underinsured i think that you know while the insurance limits have declined and we're going to work to try and get them back up as capacity increases you know i feel our risk management program is strong uh and i feel confident that you know it insulates the buildings from a lot of risk uh, that would otherwise, you know, potentially run up the costs. Okay, so I think that'll be the last question because it is 10 after now and a lot of the folks have dropped off. But as I said earlier, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, repeat uh, all of these questions and give some answers and we'll, we'll publish something that, you know, gives a response to all this. And of course, many of you know me um, and you know, I'm reachable. So if you have questions or you want to discuss any of this, you know, further, Please let me know. I'm happy to be responsive um, as much as I can. Um, you know, Bob Owens mentioned earlier about the personal lines. You know, I've spoken with many of you folks and other boards that, you know, we're simply happy to put together a personal lines program and help you develop personal lines um, requirements for the building. And, you know, Bob is happy to come in and do some seminars, either via Zoom or in the lobby or, you know, whatever is necessary to help educate folks. Um, and so, all of that aside, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for attending the seminar today. Um, we're happy to be able to you know, call all of you our clients, uh, and we're looking forward to you know, growing our program uh, and strengthening the program as we move forward. Uh, I want to thank all of the panelists. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, I recognize this, is, <laughs> this has been a long you know, hour uh, with a lot of dense material, but we really appreciate everyone's participation and the relationships that we have with all of you. So thank you. Thank you all. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Take care. Good night.